book parades as a work of history, and it was written as a work of history. Its subject, I have to give you this warning because it deals with weapons of mass destruction, um, misplaced intelligence, wrong intelligence, catastrophic miscalculation, um, and the delicate balance between the use of force and diplomacy and the role of each and how quickly you go from one to the other or back again. If that resonates uh, in modern day politics, so be it. Uh, this is a most dramatic and now after 40 years finally complete story because thanks to the collapse of the Soviet Union we now know a good deal about what was happening at the other side during this crisis. Um, since there's hardly anybody in the room that's 65 and older, I have to explain what I'm talking about. Uh, unless you're 65 and older, you are not mature enough to really grasp uh, the, the nature of the missile crisis. If you were younger, you were probably in some school where they had you ducking under the desks to uh, protect you against a nuclear attack. Um, that was the nature of our fear um, back in 1962 and in the post-war years in general. There was this other great superpower, uh, the Soviet Union, an empire with nuclear weapons that beat us into space uh, and that for the first time had the capacity to reach American targets, to bomb American cities with nuclear weapons. And it was the first time not 9-11 was the first time, but 1960s was the first time that the oceans no longer protected us in the American psyche. And that's how this crisis developed. We and the Russians were in a terrifying and terrible arms race. Um, this crisis came along and produced the pivotal moment in what was a 40-year Cold War wasn't so cold when it broke out into actual fighting in Korea and in Vietnam, but it was called the Cold War because fortunately nuclear weapons were never actually thrown. But it was a worldwide competition for influence, for allies, for resources, um, and some people thought that it was being fought to the death, that if we didn't hit them first, they were gonna hit us first, and this, this was another Hitler developing over there in the Soviet Union, and that was the nature of the terrifying psychology under which we were operating. Suddenly, and this is how the crisis started, we discovered uh, in October 1962, because of, we had this wonderful high-flying airplane that could take miraculous pictures from 13 miles up in the air, we discovered nuclear missiles being installed on the island of Cuba, 90 miles from Key West, and aimed at the soft underbelly of the United States because all our defenses, such as they were, were really up against the Arctic zones because we, if we expected an attack ever from the Soviet Union, it was going to come from the north rather than the south. Uh, it turned out there were only going to be, well, we didn't know this at the beginning, only about 40 missiles, but enough to put American cities everywhere except the corner of Oregon and Washington um, under, the, under potential risk. We discovered these missiles. We didn't know what their purpose was. We didn't know why they were doing this to us. And they, and they arrived at a time when John F. Kennedy, who was the President of the United States, felt doubly vulnerable, not just to missiles, but to blackmail in negotiations and to political oppositions at home for a combination of reasons. Just the year before, he had tried to topple Fidel Castro uh, in an, with an invasion of emigre, Cuban emigres, that became the Bay of Pigs invasion. It was a total fiasco, and Kennedy withdrew from that effort. He abandoned these fellows on the beach in Cuba because they were supposed to inspire a revolution, and they didn't. And so in the eyes of the Russians, in the eyes of Khrushchev, Kennedy thought he was somebody who didn't have the guts to go in there and finish Castro off. 
So he felt doubly vulnerable to what Khrushchev might next do to him because he regarded him as weak. They had met once in Vienna and Khrushchev beat him up verbally and orally demanding the peace treaty in Europe because he wanted us to recognize Soviet influence over half of Europe, the, the communist eastern half. At any rate, these missiles arrived when he felt internationally under the gun and weak, and even more important, because after all, Kennedy had had, that, had his own Florida kind of election. He was elected by one vote per precinct. He felt vulnerable politically at home, and the Republicans were all over him in the 1962 congressional election um, because he was tolerating advances by communists in Southeast Asia, in Laos, Vietnam, and most of all, in Cuba, and there were all these ships, Russian ships, plying from ports in the Soviet Union to Cuba, and what is going on there? I bet they're gonna have a missile base. Kennedy's best intelligence people, in a formal analysis of the situation, assured him that that would never happen. The Soviet Union had never put nuclear weapons outside their own territory. They were not about to do that. We could see where it might be to their benefit to do it, but we bet you they won't. So it, with that assurance and with the Republicans screaming at him, Kennedy kept escalating the threats because he felt safe in doing so. That of course, if they ever put nuclear weapons, offensive weapons, he called them, in Cuba, that would be very grave and we really have to take tough action. And he escalated the threats, confident that he wouldn't have to act um, and confront the Russians in any serious way. And lo and behold, three weeks before the election, that airplane discovered those missiles on the ground. And there began one of the most fascinating, dramatic, tense, scary confrontations um, of the entire century. And because it was all concentrated in just 13 days, Seven days for Kennedy to decide what to do, and six days to then throw the gauntlet and work it out with Khrushchev somehow, um, make him back down. Uh, because it's concentrated in this way, it, it really makes for, for a gripping, almost novel-like um, saga, um, to which I was attracted, one, because Khrushchev was sort of my man in a repertorial sense. I'd watched him really up close. I'd been to Havana and covered Castro as he was turning to the communist camp. And now I was in Washington. And it was my story, and I wrote about it then. And I had theories about it, but I couldn't prove them. And I kept watching the scholarly literature as every decade we learned more and more of what was really going on. Most of the best stuff only in the last decade including verbatim recordings out of the White House that finally came out in Toto uh, two years ago. And with that rich material lying all around me, but nobody having pulled it together in a popular and dramatic way, I decided to do this book. Um, the seven days of deciding what to do went from Kennedy's first reaction, that son of a gun, that isn't what he called him, but um, uh, he can't do that to me. He deceived me, he lied to me about what he was doing in Cuba in their secret correspondence. Um, and if trust breaks down between the Soviet nuclear power and the American nuclear power, who knows what can happen down the line, we've got to be able to communicate and talk to each other and if we're gonna to lie to each other, we, I have to draw that line in the sand. He was doing it for diplomatic reasons, he was doing it for world reasons, the leader of an alliance arrayed against the Soviet Union, but he was also doing it, as he candidly admitted, uh, for political reasons at home. His own authority was at, at risk, because if he had not resisted, he probably would have been destroyed. And at one point, he even said to his brother, uh, if we hadn't done this, we would be impeached. His first instinct was, I don't want to know what to do, I know what to do, those missiles are coming out. The only thing I want my advisors to help me figure out is how to get them out. Are we going to shoot them out, or are we going to negotiate them and trade them out? That was his first instinct. As he looked down at what he called the abyss of thermonuclear realities, he decided very quickly he really didn't want to shoot. To shoot meant either giving Khrushchev warning, 
that he's going to shoot, in which case Khrushchev starts threatening back and they immediately escalate the tension. Or it means attacking these missiles without warning, in which case he's going to kill Russians first day and the Russians will have no they might not be able to fight us very well in our backyard in the Caribbean, but they'll surely attack us where we have bases in Turkey or in, in the middle of Germany in Berlin uh, and the fat's in the fire. And the only way I could defend Berlin is with nuclear weapons because we had just you know 1,500 men or something sitting out there like vulnerable dunks. So very quickly, the President of the United States, while he had scared the world and thrown the gauntlet and said to Khrushchev out loud, those missiles better leave or we are headed for trouble. Any attack from Cuba on the United States, I will regard as an attack from the Soviet Union and I will retaliate in kind and we stand at the abyss uh, and Mr. Khrushchev, get, get those missiles out. That was the tone of voice and the whole world ducked under the desk. Um, having done so, he then turned around and started sending signals to Khrushchev that if he was willing to talk, if he was willing to negotiate, um, we were ready to talk as well. And there developed over the next five days uh, a dance at sea. Kennedy's, to prove that he was serious, he threw a blockade around Cuba aimed at missile ships, ships carrying missiles. A blockade, is, as Khrushchev was quick to observe, is an act of war, but it was not yet shooting anybody. Khrushchev, in turn, sent quick orders to his ships to stop the ones carrying missiles or nuclear weapons, or even to turn around. But the blockade could not stop the construction of the bases in Cuba itself. And so there was a terrible sense of urgency. My God, are they, the, the Pentagon was saying, are they going to arm those missiles, going to put nuclear warheads on top of them and be ready to fire them in case of trouble? If we're going to get rid of those missiles, let us attack now, Mr. President. We want to fly a thousand sorties across Cuba, knock out everything we can see that might possibly be a missile base, and then we want to invade a week later uh, and really make sure we've got the whole island cleaned out. And the temptation of getting rid of Castro in the process was, a, was, a, was a, 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 an extra feature of the plan. The president, to his everlasting credit, I think, uh, resisted this kind of advice mightily and maneuvered and maneuvered with the Russians to see whether he could negotiate his way out. On the Russian side, to our everlasting benefit and Khrushchev's credit, exactly the same thing was happening. When Kennedy threw the gauntlet, Khrushchev's advisors immediately said to him, well, if they're going to blockade Cuba, let's blockade Berlin. And then we'll be on an even basis, and then let's talk again. And Khrushchev's first reaction, now that we know it, was, I not only don't want to hear that kind of talk, I don't know how to get out of one predicament, and now you want me to have two predicaments. Khrushchev had also acted out of weakness. As we now know, the true, he claimed at the time that he was doing this to defend Cuba against another American invasion, sponsored invasion, but that wasn't the reason. The reason was that his long-range missile program had turned into a fiasco. He had barely 20 long-range missiles that might be able to reach the United States if they had certain fuel and if they had certain guidance systems and if they could figure out the true coordinates of the American targets they might want to hit, none of which they had. And his generals were all over his back. He was cutting the army, cutting the navy, because he needed the money for domestic development and his army was getting frantic and he needed the army to hold on to power in, in that system. Uh, they wanted to catch up with the United States. We had them outgunned, in truth, 17 to 1. As best Kennedy knew at the beginning of the crisis, it was only 10 to 1. But the missile gap was entirely in our favor. And Khrushchev was saying, I've got these short-range missiles that I've got aimed at Paris and London and Berlin. They can, I can dominate. The, the, the diplomacy of Europe. He didn't intend to use them, but it was, a, a, it was a way of strengthening his negotiating power. If I put some of them in Cuba, 
Um, I won't close the gap against the United States, but at least I'll make them sweat a little bit, and they'll be as vulnerable as I am, and the mutual deterrence, we can then begin to talk a little bit as equals. That, so he was acting out of weakness. When he put them there, of course, we took his, his action to be highly belligerent and aggressive. This was the man who said, I'm going to bury you. Um, what he meant was he's going to, communism is going to bury capitalism, but the language was tough and, 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 and belligerent. He was acting out of that weakness. And here was Kennedy, out of his own sense of vulnerability and weakness, giving a belligerent response to what Khrushchev had done. And out of that came this incredible five, six days of, of worldwide tension. The whole world was, was frightened to death, uh, legitimately so. And indeed, the people in the Kremlin were frightened to death, and the people in the White House were frightened to death. And it's only now that we can look down from the skies, so to speak, at what each side was doing, that we were nowhere near war. That much of what was going on, in fact, was theatrics to impress the other side. Much of it was the bluff of force to the point where our military was really angry because they were being used for diplomatic purposes to send a message to Moscow rather than to fight, which they thought the president meant to do eventually, and they wanted, they didn't like the leash he held on them. Anyway, it's terribly dramatic how all this plays out among the characters, and the president and his brother as they maneuvered on our side, Khrushchev as he did on ours. It got hairy toward the end when the confusing, uh, communication between Moscow and Washington, some of it literally by telegram. You put messages into numbers code, call up Western Union Telegraph Company, a young man comes on a bicycle and takes the message from the Russian embassy, and, and as the Soviet ambassador wrote in his memoir, we had to hope he wasn't going to stop for a pizza uh, on the way. Um, this was the method of communication, and it finally boiled over into public broadcasts. Uh, over Castro's head, they left Castro in the lurch. They didn't care what he thought of what was going on. One of our planes was shot down because of Castro's belligerence uh, and what he was doing, and at, was shot down by a Russian unit on the very day that Khrushchev had assured Kennedy, while we're talking, there's no, you don't have to worry, I've got complete control of what's going on on the island, and Kennedy said, some control. Um, at any rate, they rushed each other into a deal, part of which was public. Kennedy promised not to invade Cuba. He had no intention of invading. He, hoped, he was hoping, trying to shoot Castro and sabotage his economy and topple him somehow, but he had no intention of invading because it was his feeling. His, his chief military advisor called Cuba the Big Muddy. He was going to get stuck there, and it would take 20,000 casualties to chase Castro's guerrillas up in the mountains. Uh, and that for all the power that we had, it was good, would be a very tough and ugly battle. And so he didn't want to invade. If that resonates today, I, I let you think, uh, contemplate uh, the situation. Um, but he promised not to invade Cuba because that was easy. He had no intention to do so and to give Khrushchev that fig leaf. But more than that, there was a secret part of the deal, which we didn't know for sure about for about 10 years. And that was we would pull out some obsolete missiles from Turkey that we had aimed at the Soviet Union so that Khrushchev could sort of show his own military, look, I got something in return. It was useless. The missiles were useless and we had submarines that replaced them um, with their own, with better nuclear weapons. And so his military was not fooled. They came away from this crisis feeling never again. Uh, they accused Khrushchev of harebrained schemes and a year later when for domestic reasons Khrushchev was challenged and overthrown uh, his own military refused to defend him. And so by throwing their weight with his enemies internally, they destroyed him. Kennedy came out of this, of course, with great new authority because the victory looked even greater. They kept the Turkey part of the deal secret, so it looked like he'd really forced uh, humiliation on both Castro and Khrushchev. Finally, a Democrat could brag that he was not weak, uh, in, in resisting communism and get the Republican monkey off his back. Um, he did very well in the congressional elections and, in Castro's words, gained new authority in the world and in the United States. 
and then tried to use that authority to establish a new live and let live relationship with the Russians. Started making very conciliatory speeches that Khrushchev really warmed to. And uh, they began, they negotiated a hotline for quick communication in future crises. They negotiated the first arms control deal to stop nuclear testing in the atmosphere so as not to spoil the environment. And they were headed somewhere, but within a year, of course, the president was dead, shot, and the year after that, Khrushchev was thrown out. And he was so weak after this crisis, for many reasons, not just the crisis, that nothing came of it except a big arms race. The Russians felt never again were they going to be caught that short. Um, and it took 20 years uh, for them expensively to catch up. But it was a more stable period afterwards. Nobody ever again dared to approach this kind of a brink. And so this really became the pivotal moment of this 40-year war, Cold War. Um, it was, uh, we marched up the mountain, we walk, they walked down, the two superpowers walked down the street with nukes drawn, and they stared at each other, and they stared into the abyss, and they retreated very quickly in a rather brilliant diplomatic performance. And that story, just 13 days, uh, is my story, and I had great fun writing it. What I would like to ask you, sir, is just share with us briefly your uh, uh, read on Nikita Khrushchev and also of President Kennedy. Wow. That's, an that's another whole book. Um, Nikita Khrushchev was one of Stalin's henchmen who had to uh, engage in, in, in some of the most outrageous purges uh, at Stalin's side and who later in life confessed that he didn't know why he survived, um, except that uh, maybe members of Stalin's family, for some reason, uh, had taken a liking, a shine to him. Um, he was the boss in, mostly in the Ukraine area. Uh, what really became a life-shaping experience for him, uh, he was crude, uneducated, but quite brilliant uh, in politics. He had to be to survive. Um, he was ugly, uh, he was bald and fat, and his teeth were full of steel uh, fillings that showed when he smiled. Um, but he went, he was the political commissar at the Battle of Stalingrad, the great battle in which the Russians bled to death but stopped the German Nazi advance uh, into the Soviet Union. And it was a life-shaping experience. And he came out of that not only determined never again to tolerate a war um, uh, with, with a Western country and to want expansive defenses, but he came out of it, I think, with a new humanistic streak that Stalin had misled the country and had purged so many pe millions of people and had locked up. The Siberia was full of political prisoners. And if he ever got the chance, he was going to change the system. And lo and behold, he got the chance. He, three years after Stalin's death, he outmaneuvered uh, some of the other henchmen um, and got control of the government with the help of the army, with Marshal Zhukov, who was the great hero of World War II, and sure enough, used that power. Uh, under great stress, he released most of the prisoners, but every step forward toward reform uh, involved a step and a half back because the Stalin instinct in the Communist Party was working even against the leader of that Communist Party. So he was a very complex character. When he, at the peak of his power, which happened to be the three years when I was there, just before the missile crisis, he traveled the world, he rode elephants in India, he visited Disneyland and, and, and President Eisenhower in the United States. He was very curious about the world around them, totally different animal uh, than we had seen before in the Soviet Union. And while when I first came to Moscow, in my mind, he was the butcher of Budapest. He had suppressed a revolution in very bloody ways in Hungary. Uh, up close, he began to see again that this was the kind of belligerence that came out of a sense of weakness and vulnerability, an exaggerated sense of defense. Um, he was really the precursor uh, 
this fellow Gorbachev, who finally presided over the collapse of the Soviet Union, was a young man who grew up in the, what we came to be known as the Khrushchev Thaw after Stalin. And so Khrushchev was really the model of reform that later generations took to the logical extreme and abandoned, to all intents and purposes, abandoned the communist system altogether. Um, Kennedy. Uh, the great quality that Kennedy showed in this crisis, which was not clear before when he was, felt himself weak, I mean, he was, um, he, he didn't only exaggerate he, uh, when he was running against Nixon, he uh, came close to lying. He was outrageous in his demagoguery, claiming that Nixon and Eisenhower had recreated a missile gap and that, well, that we were weak toward the Soviet Union because, again, out of his sense of protecting Democrats against Republican charges, he was going to outbid them. And he was tough on Cuba, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When he came into power and when this crisis developed, we saw a totally different animal. This was a man who was introspective, profoundly so, uh, who again understood from World War II uh, the nature of, and the risks of warfare, um, who wanted to see himself as others saw him, who saw himself as history might see him, who wanted to understand what Khrushchev was really all about and called for almost a, a seminar of his experts to teach him how to get around this fellow. Um, this was a president who ultimately was absolutely devoted to the idea that force had to be truly a very, very last resort way down the road. Um, and here we see that instinct in, in action uh, against a lot of tensions and pressures going the other way. So these were in their own way, these were both both vulnerable and weak, and yet in, a, in another sense, uh, terribly strong and interesting uh, leaders. And if this book has a theme at all, um, it is that leaders matter.